In this early time, we only have a few brief stories of what the Prophet ﷺ would do. And that is that he would preach to his immediate friends and family. And we already mentioned that the first convert, really the first convert would have been his wife Khadija. And the second convert would have been Waraqa ibn Nawfal. The third convert, people differ. Is it Ali or is it Abu Bakr or is it Zayd ibn Haditha? These three. And one of the easiest ways to resolve this, they say the first child to convert was Ali and the first slave to convert was Zayd and the first adult free man to convert was Abu Bakr. Of course, as for Ali, there's no question that he was of the earliest of converts. Why? Because he's being raised by Khadija and the Prophet Muhammad And when they convert, obviously, Ali as well is going to convert. The next batch of converts, the next four converts, all of them are at the hands of Abu Bakr. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Uthman ibn Affan, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. The next companion who converted was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The next batch of converts was a lot of the slave class. Most famous amongst them is of course Bilal ibn Abi Rabah and Khabbab ibn al-Arat and Yasir and his wife Sumayya and their son Ammar and many other stories. So all of these converts, they began to convert after these elite noblemen of the Quraysh and Ibn Mas'ud had converted. The first three years of the da'wah, the Prophet did not preach to the masses. The da'wah is private. And therefore, in these three years, the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ did not face any public opposition. The Muslims are being taught their religion without any persecution. It seems, there's no authentic narration, but it seems that at this early stage, Salah and Wudu were legislated. Jibreel came down and he taught the Prophet ﷺ how to do Wudu, and he taught him how to pray. And at this stage, prayer was voluntary, not obligatory. And it was made obligatory in Isra wal Mi'raj. And that's why when Allah told him to pray, he didn't need to be taught how to pray, because he already knew how to pray. Also, in this early stage, prayer was only two rak'at. And this is where Aisha says in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. This open preaching, it took place three years after Iqra came down. And Allah revealed a number of verses to command him to preach publicly. So the Prophet ﷺ first invited his immediate tribe, and that is the sons of Hashim and Abdi Manaf. And this is of course his immediate uncles and aunts, and he invited them, it is said, to his own house. And he told Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was at that time a young boy, he told him to prepare a little bit of food and broth, some soup and a little bit of food. And they didn't have that much, they only had one leg of lamb. But he invited over 40 of their adults. Over 40 of the adults came and the Prophet ﷺ was the first to eat and he blessed it. And the reporter or the narrator says that even though the food was in one plate, all 40 of them ate to their fill as if they ate the entire plate themselves. This is one of the first miracles that is happening. And they drank from this soup that was in one cup as if this was their only cup and they all drank from it to their fill. And Abu Lahab sensed that something was going to happen. So Abu Lahab was scared that the Prophet Sallallahu would make public what was now private. So before they finished eating, he stood up and he gave an excuse and he said he needs to go back. And of course, Abu Lahab is one of the seniors, he's one of the elders and he is an immediate uncle. So when he leaves, it kind of destroys the aura that was being created that something is going to happen now. And so when he gave an excuse, a number of others gave an excuse and they left. The Prophet understood that this was a tactic of Abu Lahab. A few days later, he did the same thing. He told Ali to make another meal, he cooked it and he invited them again this time before they could finish he stood up and he began preaching and he began by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he said oh Bani Abdul Muttalib oh my fellow tribesmen I do not know of any Arab before me who is coming to his people with a message that is better than what I am coming to you with I'm coming to you with something that will give you your deen and your dunya this world and the akhirah I'm coming to you as a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you leave your idolatry and you turn to him then Allah will give you all the good of this world and give you the jannah in the next and he went on preaching and preaching Abu Lahab became irritated at this. He said to the people around the Prophet ﷺ that this seems to be an unworthy message. We have our ways and the ways of our forefathers. And who does this young man think he is to come and oppose the ways of our forefathers? And he was the only one who was harsh. The rest of his uncles and aunts took the message not that seriously. It is said in one of the uh, source books, Ali stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, I will help you. 
Now he went public to the whole city of Mecca. This report is reported in Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ climbed the mountain of Safa and he began calling the people and they waited for everybody to assemble and then the Prophet ﷺ gave that famous speech that all of us know. How do you trust me? And they said, we know nothing but good from you. You are our son and the son of our brother. You are our nephew and the son of our uh, one that we know. Have you heard any lie from me? We have heard nothing but good. You are Al-Ameen. And then he said, if I were to tell you that there is an army attacking, because again, he's standing on one side of Mecca and he can see what they cannot see. Would you believe me? Am I that trustworthy that if I were to tell you that I see an army right now, would you take action and become panicked and go and prepare yourselves? And they said, Ajal, yes. We never heard you ever say a lie. And so here is when the Prophet said, then know therefore that I am a warner sent by Allah to proclaim the coming of a severe punishment on the day of judgment unless you turn to him and leave your idolatry. Save yourselves from the fire of hell, I will not be able to help you. O Bani Murra ibn Ka'b, save yourselves from the fire of hell. O Bani Abdul Manaf, O Bani Abdul Muttalib. And he began with the furthest tribe that was related to him and he worked his way inward. And then he began mentioning his uncles by name. And then he concluded with the person who was the most dear and the most beloved to him. And he said, Oh Fatima binti Muhammad, save yourself from fire hell. I cannot save you on the day of judgment, except that from this world, I will give you all that I have. This is when the infamous incident happened where Abu Lahab stood up and he took up some stand, sand and he threw it in the direction of the Prophet and he said, That may you be cursed. Is this why you called us here? And this is when, of course, Allah revealed in the Quran, Abu Lahab was the one, the first person to publicly oppose the message and to publicly ridicule the message. From this point onwards, the Prophet started preaching everywhere, in public venues, in front of the Kaaba. When the Hujjaj came, when visitors came to Mecca, in the marketplaces of Mina, this is when the Prophet's da'wah became public. And of course, this is when the public opposition began as well. So when the Prophet started preaching, the first thing they do, they appeal to Abu Talib. And they went to him gently and they said, Oh Abu Talib, this is your nephew cursing our idols, preaching a message that is different than our forefathers. Surely you cannot let this happen. And Abu Talib, we don't know exactly what he says. The riwayah says that he said to them, He gave them some gentle words and he had them go their way, hoping that the matter would go away. A few weeks later, they come to Abu Talib again. They try to threaten him. They try to bribe him. They try to cajole him. They say to him, we cannot take this anymore. Your nephew is insulting our forefathers. The Prophet ﷺ did not curse their forefathers. It's his own forefathers, right? But what is he saying? Tawheed. The Prophet ﷺ never cursed their idols. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ دِعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Do not curse their false idols. And so they say, we cannot bear this anymore. You either stop him from preaching yourself or you hand him over to us and we do as we please. Never had Abu Talib been confronted with such hostility from his own Banu Hashim. And he called his nephew, the Prophet and he said to him, Oh my nephew, my people have come to me and they have said such and such. So be merciful to you and be merciful to me. Emotional blackmail here. And do not place me in a situation that I cannot bear. Abu Talib loved the Prophet more than he loved his own children. And the Prophet also had the same type of love that he would have for his own father. And this was his full uncle. And here is when the Prophet himself became overwhelmed with emotion. And he said that famous statement that, Oh my uncle, Wallahi, if they were to give me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, Wallahi, I could not give up this message until I succeed in what I'm doing or I die a death in this path preaching what I am preaching. And in another version, which is probably more authentic than this one, he said to his uncle, do you see the sun, oh my uncle? And his uncle said, yes. So he said, Wallahi, I have no more power to stop preaching than you do to light your stick from this sun. He has a stick in his hand, right? To light your stick with this sun. You cannot do that similarly, I cannot do this as well. And when Abu Talib saw this persistence, he saw in the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ, that passion, that sincerity, he said to him, do what you will, my nephew, for wallahi, I will never come to you again to stop what you're doing.
and he lived up to his word, even this did not satisfy the Quraysh. When they heard of this, that he tried and he failed, they then came to him again, a complete delegation of the Quraysh and not just the Banu Hashim. They come to him and they say to him, okay, look, we heard you tried. We understand he's your nephew. We have a proposition to make. We have chosen the most noble of all of the people of Mecca, the most noble young man. And this is the son of Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira, Al-Umara ibn Walid. And one son for one son. We'll hand over Al-Umara to you, okay? He will become your son. And in return, you hand over your son or your nephew to us, and we do as we please. At this, the Abu Talib became extremely angry. And he said, what's an evil bargain or what a foolish transaction? You want me to take care of one of your own so that I fatten him with my food while you take my son and you kill him? So Mutam ibn Adi uh, stood up and he said to Abu Talib, he said, oh Abu Talib, I think that your people have done as much as they humanly can. You need to accept one of these offers now. And this was literally, you can say, Abu Talib versus all of the people of Mecca. And so Abu Talib takes on a bravery that is wallahi unbelievable. And he says to Mut'im directly, O oh Mut'im, this is a plot that you have hatched. To stand up at this time and to publicly take sides, you had this plan from before. And then he says and he threatens them, do as you please, I am not going to budge from my position. And Allah Azza wa willed that the Quraysh back down.